place. It makes its decision. And, uh, you know, we're going to see today many applications where it just had to happen, and it did happen, and it happened just successfully. And, you know, everyone else, you know, should, you know, be hoping to contribute to the success of future two crane lifts. So we uh, have visions of two crane lifts. You know, typical visions are probably such a, something like this, such as lifting and erecting large trusses. Like I said, though, we're, we're not going to be talking about that today. How about this? Erecting long, flexible rebar cages, trying to upend them and, you know, put them down a drilled shaft. Yeah, it's a great talk. Love to spend time on that. We just don't plan on doing that today. That could be another talk. How about working in a uh, refinery or similar facility, upending vessels? Sure, this happens all the time, tailing operations. Excellent application for two crane lifts. It's not what we're going to be talking about today. And one of my favorites, this non-typical situation for a two crane hook uh, operation is a demolition of a viaduct in Long Island using two hooks from an overhead gantry crane that's typically used to erect precast segments. Another great topic of a talk I'd love to give, and we're not going to be doing it today, though. What we are going to be talking about is right here, some erection of bridge girders, both a large precast type, like these shown on Alaska Way Viaduct, or a more traditional steel, you know, built up plate girder here in New England, a little bit closer to our office. And of course, you know, we, we generally think of big cranes when we're talking two crane or multi crane lifts. However, you know, multi-crane lifts are not exclusive to big cranes. Many times, such as this situation here on a redecking of the Tappan Zee Bridge, removing and replacing panels overnight for traffic to, to be riding on at the rush hour, uh, you know, dictated the use of two 45-ton cranes. It worked just fine. And speaking of demolition, here's a fairly typical operation that's necessary for two cranes working uh, across from a river on both sides of the river where you just can't get a crane out in the middle, deep valley or whatever site constraint might be at present. And just keep in mind, you know, demolition is always the trickier operation, right, with two cranes because, you know, it's critical that the load is taken generally at the maximum radius and, and seldom with any type of uh, gradual fashion associated with it. So, the operator doesn't know he's got the load till he's got it all, which obviously can lead to problems that we want to avoid. Speaking of demolition, here's a larger uh, picture of some deck demolition happening at the uh, Tappan Zee Bridge with two cranes, you know, and you might not be able to see both cranes that well. In fact, you know, you might say some of the quality of these photos isn't the best, and you know, that's probably because these are all photos that myself or my staff or some contractor friends took along the way. So while the photographs might be a little bit hard to read, a little bit, you know, maybe not the highest quality, I'm going to guarantee you that the projects we're talking about today are of the highest quality. You know, two crane lifts are especially getting popular for accelerated bridge construction, or ABC as it's called. Here we're setting uh, deck panels at the Brooklyn Bridge for again an overnight operation that has to has to be completed by the morning rush hour. You got crane one in the foreground, crane two in the background, and a deck panel in between. Really good application for two crane picks. And here's another favorite application that we've worked on a favorite project rather. Uh, it's uh, Dingle Ridge Road in Brewster, New York. This is a lateral slide job, so you're looking at 80-ton precast next beams being set to uh, by two, I believe they're Manitowoc cranes on crane platforms, putting them in position in a temporary bridge staging area to be slid into final position at a later date. Again, another good story has to we could have there. Anyway, moving on. What can go wrong? Well, unfortunately, something like this can happen. This this is a photograph of a 
bad accident that occurred here in Connecticut over the Housatonic River in 2004 we were involved with. You'll see Crane 1 in the foreground or basically the remnants of Crane 1. You're not going to see Crane 2 because it's underwater. And note the the pick that they were picking here, the bridge girder, it's totally buckled and kind of crashed and burned. So what can go wrong? Everything could go wrong. Fatality. The crane operator for crane one passed away. Damage to both cranes, scheduled delay, all sorts of havoc, obviously. So we, we all know we want to avoid this situation, and we can avoid it. And you might wonder why this happened, and I'm going to say for sure, because we were personally involved, that the six most important issues were not properly considered in this lift plan. So on a more positive note, what can go right? Well, you know, let's say we should be following the proper procedures, which number one would be to prepare a complete lift plan. I guess it's obvious and I hate to state the obvious, but sometimes it's necessary just to reinforce the point. You know, and we should always consider two crane operation a critical lift in my opinion. And I know that every company and organization out there has a different definition for critical lift and that's fine. It's, there's, there's no universal. Um, definition, there's been attempts made and, and very recently even in, a, in, in some of the documents we were talking about. I don't think anybody though that's got any experience would, would dispute the fact that a two crane operation, no matter what you're lifting, should be considered a critical lift. And you know, the best way to put together a complete lift plan is like the best way you do anything on a construction site. You have to interact with the field. You have to visit the site, get out of your seat, get, to, get feedback from the crew, have the crew come to your office and show draft plans, you know, through iterations. Don't don't try to be exclusive. Don't work in a, don't work in a box. And then after you get your final plan put together, make sure you get a thorough review of the plan. You know, whether that's by an outside party or the reviewing agency or some type of peer review. You know, none of us are perfect here, myself included, by a long shot. It always pays to have a uh, second or third set of eyes reviewing these type of plans. Oh. And of course, we should be following the plan. And if, or rather when, situations develop, we all know we should be communicating, not deviating. You know, they always say when all else fails, you can always look at the spec. And this New York State Steel Construction Manual is an excellent example of a document that has great nuggets of information. And likewise, the Connecticut DOT standard spec, which is pretty much complete, uh, a complete rewrite of the New York State DOT spec, has some really good information in it. And I've highlighted and underlined, I guess, italicized those nuggets, I guess you might say, they're sprinkled within this spec that constitute the six most important issues. It's just maybe not organized the way I would like to see it. And Today I'm going to attempt to take all of these important points and just try to put some clarity to it and maybe make it easier to remember. And here's a couple other really good useful resources. You know, Mike was mentioning the, uh, the P30 just came out in 2014, planning for load handling activities, full of a wealth of information. It's a new document, obviously, first published just uh, a year ago. You really need to get yourself a copy of that. And likely you have or have seen the, what most of us call the Bible, the Cranes and Derricks by Shapiro Brothers. Great stuff. At the end of the show, by the way, we'll list these again for you to take down that. But anyway, let the drum roll begin. We're ready to talk about the six most important issues. And issue number one is verify the load and center of gravity be lifted pretty obvious stuff and we all know that that's important. Let's dig into some of the fire, finer points. What we like to do in this office is always add a percentage to the lifted loads. We, we really uh, recommend going 2 to 10 percent. I'll explain that a little bit further. For erection operations, because shop drawings and catalog cuts are put together again by humans, drafters, you know, salespeople, whoever they are of engineering, engineers, supervisors, we can't 
trust inherently the weights that are given without double checking. And even after double checking and confirming that they're correct, we'd recommend adding two to five percent for miscellaneous, for contingency purposes, and then for demolition operations. You know, typically we're not going to have you know much to work on. A lot of drawings are you know maybe there, maybe not. Even if they are there, we need to visit the site. We need to uh, realize that if it's existing, it's probably been there for many years, and people have added uh, components or some kind of weight to the structure. And because of the uncertainty of demolition and the riskiness of demolition, as mentioned earlier, we're recommending adding 10% to those loads. And as with any rule, there's always the exception, and that would say it would be when you're talking about railroad or other agencies that are asking you to put 25 to 50 percent additional load on the equipment. So in this case, since in my mind they're kind of overkilling it, you know, we do we typically do not add the two to 10 percent. So furthermore, on loads, one of my pet peeves is always to consider the block and load line weights properly. We all should know that this is usually part of the lifted load and the data is readily available it just takes a little bit of effort to confirm and that should be our, you know considered part of the job of the successful lift you know right here's a, a copy of the catalog from a crane shows the weight of the different blocks whether it's you know nine shivs or one shiv big difference number of lines load line that is and you you got to check the diameter of the rope could vary you know anywhere from three quarter to inch inch and an eighth and what happens when on-site equipment is substituted ever seen that before of course you know oftentimes the block that comes to the the site isn't the block that we thought was going to be with the crane for whatever reason hey you know it happens so don't fret you just need to check the weight it's always stamped on the on the block Go back to the drawings, double check that it's within the rigging allowance that's been made for the lift and you shouldn't have any problems. Similarly, you know, rigging is part of the load, you know, so here's a catalog cut or rather shop drawing of a typical spreader beam. You know, this weight that's given on the drawing here, I think it says 3300. That needs to be included in the weight, obviously checked in the field to make sure the delivered equipment is what you thought you were going to have. Sounds simple enough, right? So let's talk about something a little bit more complicated, determining the center of gravity and where to put the cranes. So besides the total weight, the center of gravity, in other words, the location of the, the load, you know, needs to be calculated correctly with a detailed, you know, Excel spreadsheet of some type. And then we want to distribute the loads to the two different cranes properly. I'm going to say right now it's the rule, not the exception, that on a two crane pick you generally have two different cranes two different, with two different capacities. So we want to put both cranes in their sweet spot. In other words, you know, this dimension B and this dimension A should be calculated with the intention that each crane is at a similar percent of its rated re capacity regardless of its size. So just because you might have a 200 uh, ton rig and a 100 ton rig, you, you, you definitely want to put more load into the 200 ton rig, but you still want to be at, you know, if it's 200 ton rig, you know, maybe 300 kips, which would be 75%, and 150 kips if it's a 200 ton crane. There's no reason, no logical reason to overload the larger crane, and we sometimes find people trying to do that. Oh, and did I mention that you should double check that the plans match in the field. It's real easy to get this A and B dimension wrong or very likely to get them reversed, like a mirror image. And unfortunately, we saw that happen within the last 12 months on an un unnamed job, we're going to say. So it's worth getting the tape out, double checking, stepping back, and verifying. So let's look at a real life application of this distribution of uh, loads to crane one and crane two. So I think it's pretty obvious that the girder is heavy to the right as it's haunched to one side. And this is going to be an example of a properly calculated and executed lift. I could say that with confidence, number one, because we did the design, but secondly, the contractor has completed his work. Heartland Building and Restoration it is. Cranes are not the same model as said 
earlier, and that's absolutely fine. We can work with that. Let's assume for a moment that circle represents where the center of gravity of the crane is, and you can see that the dimension A is definitely smaller than the dimension B. So that is clear indication that crane on the right, let's call it crane one, is picking a larger load than crane B. Now hopefully, they're both at a similar percent of their rated capacity, meaning they're both either at 60 or 65 or 75 percent of their rated chart. Hey Vince, this is Mike. This is a. Would this be a good place then, immediately on liftoff and and holding, to double check LMI and make sure that it it matches the calculations, get for a lift director to kind of step in and do a double check? Oh yeah, obviously before you start, you know, swinging, just just bump it off the truck a foot, right? And see, you know, after you, you know, first of all, after the tape measures are out there to just double check A and B. Yeah. That's the easy way, right? Have the uh, computer do the work for you. Yeah. Good question, Good. Mike. Thanks. All right. Let's continue with uh, issue number one, loads. I have a lot of slides on loads because there's a whole lot of uh, subtleties I'd like to talk about, especially when it comes to demolition. So, you know, with your typical bridge deck that we see all the time that we're demolishing, there's going to be some concrete left on the flanges initially with saw cutting operations and then subsequently normally all the concrete has to be removed from the flanges by a jackhammer you know which is kind of a painstakingly difficult job human nature has it that we'd like to take the path of least resistance so it's really easy for some concrete to remain on the flanges alternatively sometimes you know the crane has enough capacity that we we allow the uh, concrete to remain on the flanges, but the dimensions of the concrete are really critical to check because you could easily double the load of the girder with just a little bit of concrete on the top flanges. So here you're seeing Perini do a nice job over in Queens, New York, of removing all the concrete from that girder down the middle. It's getting close to being picked. Always remember, there could be some concrete remaining on the flanges, and if it's not in the plans, you really got to get it removed. Hate to be that bad guy, but somebody's got to keep everybody honest sometimes. So let's talk about another favorite subject of mine, demolition of fascia girders. You know, every fascia girder is, like, different. They're unique, it seems like. This one, you know, almost looks like you have two girders in one. It's a fence, pretty extensive fence on top of a girder. You know, normally you're going to find curbs and remnants of a sidewalk or utilities or brackets of some kind. There's very often additional weight on a fascia, very often it doesn't show up on the drawings, very often people miss it, as was uh, that case in that black and white slide I showed. Um, so just extra care is necessary when you, when you get to the fascia. It's not, it's not as easy as the interior girders. This one, though, again, was successfully picked at that same job. Okay, so we're ready for issue number two. So what is it? It is to make sure that the adequate capacity exists for both cranes. It's recommended, I'm going to say strongly recommended, but not mandated. It's not a law anywhere. But certainly it's good practice that the crane is operated at approximately 75% of its rated capacity. And that's the capacity that's on the chart. You can't say, well, the chart's already been reduced by 75% because you know, for stability and strength. No, we're talking about the rated capacity should be, again, you know, looked at at 75, maybe 85 percent if additional weight's been added. And, you know, there's got to be some judgment here prevailing, as in everything we do. These are not absolutes. These are strong recommendations. It's pretty easy math, but just in case it's not clear, you know, the percent capacity is more or less the total load divided by the crane capacity. So, oh, wrong button. Total load shown here, 26.3 kips or 26,300 pounds. Crane capacity is shown as 42. So you divide the two, you get 63%. Less than 85%, less than 75%. You know, should be comfortable to proceed in this manner, making the lift. You know, alternatively, you could do the inverse of this equation. 
which is just dividing 42 divided by 26.3, you go 1.6. Oh, again, my bad. Factor of safety here, and to just sum this up, then if we're looking to stay at 75 or 85 percent of capacity, our factor of safety should at least 1.18, 1.33 if no uh, percentage has been added. All right, so hopefully that's clear. Let's talk a little bit more. <clears throat> Why it's so important that adequate reserve capacity on multi-carrying lifts is preserved. And that's mainly, number one reason is because the load line is probably going to go out of plumb. Right? It can go out of plumb in two directions. It could be off lead or longitudinal with the boom, or it could go transversely, causing side load to the boom. Off lead, as the diagram shows, increases the radius which means the capacity is decreased. And then if we're going sideways, you know, the booms are generally designed, I think, for 2% side load. And we could rapidly eat up that and have problems with the boom. Of course, we all know that, you know, with two crane lifts, sometimes the movements of the piece is quite difficult and has to be carefully synchronized. And operators, just like everybody else, are not infallible. One example of a problem that could occur is if, during an erection job that one of the cranes sets down on the bearings prematurely, you might say. So I'm going to try to demonstrate that with this diagram here. Consider, consider this line to be a girder being erected by, okay, with its center of gravity right there, erected by crane one and crane two. So from this diagram, it should be obvious that crane one has a greater load than crane two because that A dimension is less than a B dimension. So this would be a problem if crane one, say, sets down on its bearing while crane two is still holding its load because now the dimensions are going to be A prime, B remains the same. Now all of a sudden A prime is greater than A, and I could also say that you know, A prime is greater than B, so crane two now has more load on it than it was designed for. This is a problem. So, you know... Never heard an operator say this, but I've heard other people say, that, oh, you know, as soon as you can't set down the load. Well, that's not true. They've got to be synchronized. All right. Finally, I'd like to say that, you know, engineers and supervisors are not infallible either, and they could easily make a mistake in their calculations or an operational procedure. So, unfortunately, with two cranes, these kind of mistakes only get magnified. So we're ready to move on to issue number three, which is make sure we consider the site constraints. You know, typically your crane radius is totally dependent on the site features. Here's a slide to remind you that also boom clearances are a big issue with cranes and oftentimes dictates the use of two cranes, this job being on the Long Island Expressway. Sorry for the slur there, LIE as we call it around here. Same job, different view, those cranes, rather large cranes, I'd say, that were certainly difficult to, to place. These positions, you know, need to be field measured, surveyed, and verified before and especially after mobilization, right? Because we could do the best job we can on paper, and the surveyors could do their best job painting out marks on the pavement, and operators do their best to get that crane threading the needle. But oftentimes it's going to vary just a little bit from what was planned, so we know. And we'd like to just reiterate, you have to spot the hook. Confirm that radius, have the operator go over the piece where he's going to be picking it, look at the LMI, like Mike was mentioning before, load moment indicator, that is. See what the radius is, make sure it's close. If not, adjust accordingly. And you're going to have a successful lift. Just wanted to point out how tight this site was. If you look at that photo on the lower right, that the outriggers and counterweights are like just almost touching each other. Quite a feat there, like that photo. And I'm sure you do this, too. That, this looks like it would uh, call into question, you know, uh, a, a review of the ground bearing pressure that might be double concentrated right there with those two outriggers so close together, huh? Yes. Uh, I'm hoping that was done. We did not personally do this lift plan, but I, you could see that there is a plate there. Uh, actually, I think I see two plates, and we're going to talk about ground bearing pressure in a little bit. And certainly, yeah, that's a big consideration here. 
Thanks. All right, so here's a nice picturesque site, as I like to say. And the crane on the left, the red crane, was not able to access its pick location unless we came up with a clever idea uh, in conjunction with the client to uh, build a crane island. So something like this is obviously going to be built by the dirt guys. We all know how, how they work. A good bunch of guys and, you know, plus or minus a foot or two is good for them. And the structures guys need to make sure that once that crane island is constructed and we get uh, the crane out there, which took a bridge to get out to the island, that the radius was as planned, and it was, and we were successfully had a good erection job here. So we're halfway through the six most important issues, so I just threw this little intermission slide in here to take a little pause and uh, just speculate a little bit. You know, should there really be seven? Because, you know, and I was trying to make it seven when I came up with this show because of the seven habits of highly effective people or seven deadly sins. But I just, I figured, you know, these seven deadly sins are all worth talking about. And I'm sure we've all been guilty of them at times. But, you know, less is more. And if we could stick to six, we shall and, and we have. On that note, I'm not sure if. Mike had any questions? You said you might throw one at me at this point. Mike, yeah, any well, questions? just one, uh, just for the uh, the uh, viewers and participants today to make sure that you uh, type in the chat box and send to Jonah any questions that you have. Well, at the end of the program, we'll try to answer, uh, get Vince to answer those for you. And there may be lots and lots of them. There may have to be some of them answered offline. But uh, if you have some uh, some questions going along, I'm sure Vince can pull back and we'll try to respond to. Uh, three or four at least uh, at the end of the of the presentation. So if you need a glass of water or anything, cup of coffee real quick, uh, grab it. Uh, Vince is going to continue on. This is a great presentation and an excellent. I'm I'm I rarely find myself recording as we go along, but I'm writing down all the things that uh, Vince is bringing up. But we've got a couple of court cases that are on uh, in hand right now, and two crane uh, basically two crane accidents and. These these are all uh, excellent reminders uh, to be uh, discussed about uh, how to plan around and manage out and mitigate the risks related to load handling with two cranes, particularly. And I don't know if you have anything downstream, Vince, about two crane lifts and that that also uh, pick and carry. So, but the the things that you've already identified, the synchronization required, and all those things, and getting out of plumb. Uh, it must be, uh, you know, an exponential uh, um, discussion to to think about two cranes that are crawling, you know, both cranes going south, you might say, and being able to keep the crane spacing appropriate so that the uh, radius stays the same for each crane must really compound the difficulty of the job. So, but this is a great presentation. We appreciate it very much. I'm looking forward to the balance of it. Okay, I guess... Uh We'll look forward to those questions, Mike, and I, I should just quickly take a moment, too, to, to say my favorite um, seven deadly sins, I don't know, somewhere between lust and greed, I don't, I don't know. But let's also take time to thank some of the guys that put together these uh, uh, photographs for me, which include the contractors of Skanska, Skanska Koch, Tudor Perini, Heartland Building and Restoration, Marino Division of Barnhart and E.E. E. Cruz. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody there. So thanks guys for helping me put this together. And hopefully some of you are out there watching. All right, so I guess I'll move on to number four of the six most important issues. That is that the support, support for the cranes must be adequate. So here's a nice picture of cranes, crawler cranes on top of equipment platforms commonplace situation, especially along the waterfront or rough terrain or in a city environment. So here's a couple of Dingle Ridge Road, a job we talked about earlier. Oh, and I forgot to mention Yonkers already. Okay, so they're another nice, great client of ours that gave us some photos. So equipment platforms have to be analyzed if they're existing or designed. If they're new, we were lucky enough to be doing all the engineering on this job, so we designed these for the crawler loads. And we also had outrigger loads to consider for hydraulic cranes that will 
come by and use these platforms occasionally. Uh, also, my wife noticed that you could say there's an item issue number three here too, an overhead utility, site constraint, boom clearance issue that would necessitate uh, a reason to be put into, implemented into the, the lift plan. Okay. Hey, how about when cranes are on barges? Should we be concerned about the uh, crane support? Of course we should. We all know that you know, it's probably more common for a mobile crane to be put on a barge on a job-by-job -job basis versus uh, one of my favorite barges here, Mr. Barge, that's got a permanently affixed crane. So for the mobile cranes, you know, you need to verify that somebody has analyzed the barge, usually it's a naval architect or engineer, that takes into account all the movements of the crane and will calculate the list and the trim, which is basically, you know, how much, you know, angular movement you're going to get in the barge, whether it be transverse or longitudinally. And, you know, all cranes need to be reduced. The capacity of all cranes need to be reduced when it's listing. And with the exception of a permanently affixed barge crane that has a chart that takes all that into consideration. Very important issue. Uh, you know, on a similar vein, crane support, you know, oftentimes is dictated by field conditions. It, you know, a lot of the times these are not going to show up on any kind of drawing. You're only going to find out if you got out of your office and walked the site and discovered stuff like this, you know, temporary shoring posts. I would definitely consider this a weak link, not a good place to support a crane. Not at all. Likewise, here is probably not a good place to support a crane. We see some rust. We actually see holes, deterioration, and section loss in his fascia girder. You know, you would expect that the bridge rating report would indicate that you have section loss, and maybe it's a critical location, maybe it's not. You know, maybe you can't get the bridge rating report easily. I'm going to say, though, that you're really entitled to it as the engineer putting together a lift plan, and they're probably out there. Sometimes it's just difficult for people to find, so they take you know, the approach that it, it's a pain in my butt to find it, so I'm not going to give it to you, forcing you to go on the field and do a study of the bridge, but, you know, on a really long bridge, it's not right. You should definitely get that report and review it because, you know, what might look like a little bit of rust is actually, you know, complete section loss. Not a good place to put a crane. All right, let's talk about crane support when working on a bridge deck. Really commonplace, right, especially with the ABC type work that's becoming very popular. So, you know, simple little details like the dunnage as shown here for this hydraulic crane, you know, must be properly designed and precisely located. Devil's always in the details. So let's talk about a couple of them. You'll see there's two different types of dunnage here. Outrigger on the left has timber dunnage, which is aligned longitudinally with a stringer below the deck. You know, none of this is visible, obviously, to the people on, on top of the deck. You have to trust that the surveyor or whoever transferred the lines up top correctly. The outrigger is on the right. You'll see there's two steel be uh, grillage beams, and that is because the stringers here are, you know, located either side of the outrigger. You know, it's pretty rare that your outrigger spacing would align exactly with stringers below. So this is a very common detail. And, you know, not, not that difficult to fabricate and not that difficult to place, but then again, it's pretty heavy and, you know, not always easy to move around the site. And finally, what about cranes when they're resting on soil, you know, which is probably, you know, very common, probably the most common place, uh, situation we're going to see out there. You know, something as simple as a timber mat, it really should be double-checked and should be designed, first of all, then double-checked to make sure that the length, the thickness, and the species is you know, designed and actually uh, brought to the site. It's the species is oftentimes mixed hardwood, which could be up to like six or seven different species, and you got to pick like the lowest value of bending and shear to do to do your job right. You know, it uh, sometimes requires plywood in place to distribute the load throughout the mat. When we're talking about a single outrigger, again, not really complicated setup. A series of plates and timbers is very often what needs to be done, and it's very, very important that the outrigger is centered uh, on this dunnage, and it's real it's a real easy mistake to make in the field, or again, it's hard to get it right the first time, so sometimes these things have to be shifted around, but you put a whole lot of force into the ground below, 
if you don't center that outrigger and if you don't have the right match. Speaking of which, you know, Mother Earth needs to be verified too. The soil bearing capacity, hopefully, they're going to give that to you, meaning, you know, the owner of the site or whoever it may be, you know, otherwise, it has to be verified. You know, if there's geotechnical report available, you might have to get your hands on that or hire a geotechnical engineer or use another rule of thumb for the bearing capacity if you know the area. Okay, moving on to issue number five. Got to check the stability of the lifted load, you know, especially with two crane picks. I mean, this, a lot of these, by the way, apply to both single and double crane picks, but it's amplified with two crane picks because chances are when you're working with two cranes, you're working with very long girders. And you've got to check the lateral torsional stability. We don't want buckling. A lot of times, contractors just say, well, I'll just pick the girders in pairs. It's going to be fine. Well, you know, they tried that. In this case, it didn't work out too well. And that's because the span the depth ratio, in other words, the length over the depth of the girder was excessive. So even picking in pairs, this particular job was unstable. And temporary top flange bracing needed to be added to prevent buckling. It ended up looking like this up close, which is more or less some steel bars welded to the top flange, creating like a truss on the top of the flange. You know, so more often than not, we're all picking single girders, and with today's design seemingly going in the direction of thinner, lighter, and longer spans, you know, you got to be careful with single girders as the distance between the pick points increases. Obviously, the stresses increase. Thinner flange plates are problematic. It's going to be less stable because they're the compression flange. And, you know, typically they're in a final condition. They've got concrete placed on them. That's going to make them composite. But when you're lifting them, they're non-composite. And then the deeper the web, the more susceptible they are to buckling. You know, one way to, one solution, I guess you might say, to deal with a top flange buckling issue is an older fashioned method of something that used to happen a lot in the 50s and 60s, a stiffening truss. Here's a drawing of a job we worked on that shows a plan view, section view of a such a stiffening truss. And here's the photograph of a stiffening truss in action. All right, so we're ready for the sixth out of six, so the six most important issues, and that is that a detailed erection or demolition procedure is provided. And I don't think it's going to be uh, easy to, to uh, explain the exact procedure here, because it is, oh, I'm trying to use a feature here I'm not too familiar with. So here's, oh, there's the procedure. You probably can't read it. It's kind of lengthy. And uh, what it basically says, is, it is detailed, though. And it says that uh, three cranes are going to be necessary to demolish this girder, the girder being right here. This crane here is going to be doing the lifting. This crane here is doing the holding to reduce the span. And this third crane here is going to be removing floor beams in a carefully uh, coordinated sequence, certainly something you don't want to be deviating from. So what happens when you take into consideration all the six most important issues? You're going to have a content operator that can go to work safely. And we as supervisors and engineers can confidently observe from a distance and not get in the way, as sometimes we tend to do. All right, so with that much said, let's look at a sample lift plan for the new Tappan Zee Bridge, courtesy of Tappan Zee Constructors, LLC. And we're going to check to see that the six most important issues are implemented, which obviously they are, and I'll just show you examples of how they are. So we're talking about a piece of the bridge on a Rockland County side. Here's a closer view of that with the uh, temporary work trestle being constructed and coffer dams and piers being constructed. You know, they're much farther along. This is a kind of an older photo. Here is a, a drawing showing a general plan of, try to highlight it this time, of the work trestle here. Here's a light duty work trestle. Here's a heavy duty work trestle. It's got fingers for cranes to be positioned on to do the erection. There's uh, five girder lines 
One, two, three, four, five. The spans are rather large. Go from here to here to here. Yeah, I'm, this distance here, I believe, is you know close to 300 feet. Curved girders add a little bit of complexity to the operation. Multiple splices on these girders, and uh, most all of these are picked with two cranes. So. Issue number one that we want to check, obviously, is loads and center of gravity. And here is a slightly masked version for showing the makeup of a girder, number 2WG4, with all the parts and pieces and its total weight. And detail, this is a typical detail takeoff. It's not one or two lines. You can see it's multiple lines. That's the kind of detail we're talking about to compare to the shop drawings. And we're adding 5% to the weight. So we've satisfied part of most important issue number one. The second part would be dealing with the center of gravity. I believe I mentioned earlier it's a curved girder. So the uh, end, some diaphragms are attached, which is, again, fairly commonplace in bridge erection. Sometimes they're on one side, sometimes they're on two sides, sometimes they're, they're not at all. So what we used here was a spreadsheet from UT Lift. Called UT, I'm sorry, it's from the University of Texas at Austin. It's called UT Lift 1.2. Really not the only way to do it. It's just our preferred method on this particular job. On straight girders, a simple spreadsheet, you know, an Excel sheet should find you this information or it could be done graphically. So this gives us a center of gravity both longitudinally and transverse directions. Help us figure out where and how to put the cranes. So here is the plan for setting, you know, one particular um, pair of girders. So let's say that, I'll try to highlight again. I think I got the highlight tool here. So the girders are starting here and here, and they're going to end up here. I think I got that right. And if you could see the drawing carefully, there we have a west and an east side shown on on each girder and they're going to actually be turned around and then once they're in this staging area it's going to be completely spliced both cranes then crane 1W we call it and crane 1E are going to walk down this finger that has been provided for them at the right location walk pick and carry splice that girder into previously erected girder here so continuing on our check of the six most important issues, has the crane capacity been checked? Sure it has. And as shown in this lift data table we like to use. So it's got to be checked for both cranes, crane 1W and 1E. You know, has the site constraints been taken into consideration? You betcha. The biggest one is the trestle and you know where the crane can basically be located. You'll notice that the crane barely fits on the fingers, so not much wiggle room, as you might say. A little bit uncomfortable. Yes. Doable. Yes. Um, are the radiuses properly um, taken into consideration? Because you know we basically have one, two uh, different radiuses there, and then the crane moves into a different position there, and the final set radius is here. And properly put into the lift data table, checked against uh, percent capacity, yes it has. And you know, one thing that happens when you put together plans like this, there's a lot of changes, a lot of iterations, and it's common for radiuses to change as you go, and it's easy to kind of miss one. So this is definitely a place that somebody reviewing drawings should be cognizant of and double checking, helping the success of the operation. All right, is a detailed procedure provided? Yes it is, it's shown here. To the right, I'm not going to go through it right now. We're running out of time, and I kind of showed you the general steps of what's happening, I believe. Suffice it to say that that is a detailed procedure. So let's check number four, stability check. So we like to use oftentimes something from New York, New York State DOT, uh, blue pages we call it, section 1034.7 which is checking the girder stability during erection. Again, there's many ways of checking this. This particular program is checking a factor of safety based on a Euler critical buckling stress. It recommends a minimum factor of safety 1.1. We like to keep it a little bit higher than that. And in this case, we have a factor of safety 1.41. We call it OK. It's 
stability check has taken place and we can move forward to looking at the support for the crane. So here's a section of the crane trestle shown across all our locations and you'll see that um, let me I probably can't write on this one but the crane beams uh, depend, you know, are directly aligned underneath the outrigger, so those are larger beams, you know, so this trestle was, you know, specifically designed for this Leap Air LR 1300, so we had control of that at design, but that's, again, not always the case, and, you know, interior, this is a pretty typical trestle design with interior beams that are weaker, because they're never going to get the crawler loads, you know, you got your two piles out here, pile, pile, excuse me, I'm a little bit off on my aim there, so this is certainly an important aspect to check. It has been checked. It was kind of easy for us in a way because we did the design of the trestle too, but of course, you know, we're doing this design months ahead of the operation and, you know, together with the contractor, we're trying to estimate, you know, where, where the um, trestle's got to be located, where the splices are going to be, where the fingers are going to be, and what's the load's going to be picked, and this is all maybe before the steel is even designed totally, which was the case here because this Tap and Z is a design build job. So a remarkable amount of planning up front that was uh, done by the contractor. We helped them out as much as we could and designed and got this trestle built. You'll see the triangular live load applied by the crawlers here and that load is uh, applied over the crane girders once again that we're talking about. You know, so it's those are these girders here. And keep in mind that you got to check different load cases. You know, we're showing a triangular load, which is typical when you're reaching over the front or rear of the crane or the, at a 45 degree mark. You could also have a trapezoidal load. Or if you're at 90 degrees slew, you're probably going to have a rectangular load, heavy on one crawler, light on the rear crawler. And then you always have the no load case to consider where you have no load on the hook. And you just have the counterweight putting all sorts of reverse pressures on a supporting structure. We use Reza 3D software here. You know, almost any you know conventionally you know commercially available software will work. That's one of our favorites. It's pretty easy to use and had a lot of success with it. All right, so down to number six, which we already talked about. So we're actually mobilized and ready to go. Cranes on a trestle, waiting steel delivery. It's going to be pretty soon. Some steels erected already nearby. At unit three, this is unit two steel. It should be happening next month. So hopefully we can have another presentation in the near future showing that steel successfully erected. So I just want to close the uh, talk with a look at a pretty nice rig and reminding us of the uh, six most important issues, verifying the loads and center of gravity, making sure it's at accurate capacity, taking site constraints for radius and boom clearance considerations. The crane is properly supported. The piece is stable. stable. And there's a detailed and procedure detailed written. Procedure written. See, I hear a little echo, hopefully, uh, just on my end. Okay, so once again, always use one crane whenever possible, and that's exactly what the folks at Tap and Z are doing. You know, for the bulk of the bridge, they're using this left coast lifter, this 1,800-ton barge derrick, beautiful piece of equipment, and they've erected some of this steel already with this rig. And it's just remarkable what they're doing out there. And that pretty much concludes the presentation. Just wanted to show you uh, some useful resources once again that you might want to get your hands on. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Okay. Awesome. Well, go ahead and uh, if we've got some questions, Jonah, uh, if you give me uh, the screen here, we can uh, see if Vince can help us out. If we've, And there may be some that come in later. Uh, so, Vince, great presentation. We appreciate it very much. And uh, we do look forward to another uh, roundup of the Tappan Zee Bridge and other subjects that you uh, would be willing to share with us. So we would uh, appreciate it very much. We look forward to it. I noted up here, I, uh, sorry, I just kind of billy bobbed this together a little bit, but I did make a highlight of the six uh, points that you made throughout, and uh, those are uh, key for uh, the success, and th these will apply certainly to standard lift plans as well as critical lift plans, single crane and multiple crane. So it's uh, always uh, important that we do our homework. I think that's the biggest 
thing we find uh, in some incidents is just uh, we have a, a uh, things falling through the cracks and we kind of get in a rush and get in a hurry and and we miss out on some of the opportunities to actually uh, check check the boxes with good homework and good detail behind them. So, Jonah, do we have any questions that we can share, or we're going to go ahead and sign off? Which what do you, what do we got? Uh, we do have a couple, um, and I know we're coming up on the hour point, so um, maybe we can just share a couple of them if that's okay. And you touched on one a little bit um, in your response just there, Mike, but. Sean was wondering if the recommendation for reducing crane operations to 75% of the published chart is intended to include engineer reviewed and planned lifts or just for general lifting? Well, I, th I think what I was saying is it, it's for any lift that involves two cranes. And every, every lift that involves two cranes should be engineered, right? And so here the question, could, could they go to 80% or 82% or 83%? Um, and it just, it sort of just drives up the issue of, of proper engineering and, and proper controls in place. I, I think we get this question too, Vince, a lot is, can they make a 90%, 90% lift on a two crane pick? And, you know, it just, it just simply ratchets up the required oversight and controls that are put in place is, as some, you know, a way we kind of address it. Yeah, okay, so now I understand the question better. And yes, I, I think I mentioned 75% is recommended strongly, it's not mandated. And typically we go to 85% as long as we know there's been some additional percentage put on a load that's calculated really well. So if we really know our loads, um, we, we feel more comfortable going up to the 85% mark. If we're working with a really high quality contractor, and you know, really great equipment, and with a lot of controls in place, you know, you can look at that number and go a little higher. That's where the engineering judgment comes into place. Perfect. Yeah. The um, the requirements of the site may restrict, and fortunately, so there's just so many things that can uh, kind of go haywire. You know, we've seen operators. I'm going to go left. You're going to go right. All of a sudden, we're out of sync, and you know, out of sync. And now that we're out of out of uh, plum um, and wind and all kinds of other things have some impact and so uh, there's you know I, I think Vince a big thing is that we just don't want there, people aren't going to be remembered as heroes by trying to take something to 92 or 95 percent for uh, each crane for a multi crane lift um, the, you know we're just we're toying with things that we just don't have control over sometimes and so trying to be conservative and work within the parameters it's always got to be the best advice, I would think. Definitely. Okay, Jonah, anything else, buddy? Um, yeah, let, let's tackle one more here. Um, a lot of questions came in, Vince, during the stability portion, especially when you're talking about um, multi-crane lifts uh, when it comes to barges. So Tom asks, are there any specifications that deal with using wooden dunnage as opposed to steel plates on bridge decks? Um, I don't believe oh, there's... So okay, for load ahead. spreading. I think it's load spreading on a bridge deck. Okay, yeah, maybe it was worded a little bit. Yeah, yeah. that is what he means. Wood versus yes. steel. You know, it, it's often the case that people ask that question, I think it's a flexibility issue. In other words, I assume what you're saying the outrigger is between two steel stringers and you have a concrete deck in between. So can you use wood instead of steel? Well, wood is not as stiff as steel and probably neither one of them are as stiff as concrete. So it becomes a stiffness issue. The stiffer, um, more rigid object is going to kind of suck up the load whether you want it to or not. So I'm not saying it isn't done all the time because it kind of is often. Timber goes across and you know spans between stringers. I guess the what's going to happen in a case like that is your concrete is probably going to crack a little bit for the, before the wood takes up the load. So we'll, we like to avoid that. And we what you saw on the slide that I showed was steel beams spanning across two stringers. And there's actually a little shim plate precisely located on the stringer spacing. 
So there's maybe like a one inch gap above that steel. So you're really putting no load on that deck in between the stringers and you're concentrating the load right on the stringers where it wants to be. So that's that's the right way to do it. You know, I, I have seen timber used and you know in certain situations, you know, it works, but it's not it's not recommended. Yeah, so it's really it's about uh, supporting and then not doing cracking or fracturing of your uh, road bed, but it's really placing the load where it's going to really need to bear, and that's on the stringers. Yeah, I mean the load, the, the wood's not going to take any load until the concrete moves. Yeah. So stiffness is your best friend there. So. Yes. Okay. Excellent, Jonah. Thanks for that. And if we've got some more, we could probably email them to Vince, and yeah. then he could respond, and uh, we could get some of those answers out. We'd appreciate it. So I'm going to turn it back to Jonah, and uh, you can wrap it up for us. But Vince, thanks so much. You, what a great job you've done and a uh, great explanation and terms we can all understand. We do appreciate it. Hey, you're welcome, and thanks for everybody signing in. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us. Again, the, the website or the URL to take the quiz is iti.com slash pdh, so professional development hour. Um, and also that email went out during the, the presentation as well. So uh, if, you, if you do have any trouble, uh, please contact me directly, Jonah at iti.com, and I'll get you straightened away. Thanks again for joining us. We'll be announcing our next showcase webinar shortly. And uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week, and the uh, rest of the summer. Thank you. If people sign out, changes? Yeah.